have the Dealmakers Google Group and the New Investors Google Group. Is there anyone here who's not getting um, those emails? No, everyone here is getting the Google Group emails. So at, at, um, at lunch, uh, I don't know if I'm getting the new investors. Um, Okay. Yeah. Uh, so if you don't think, contact at, at lunch, we'll make sure you're in the groups because valuable information is coming over those Google groups. This, this, everyone. I'm so excited to be here. Rick is a fantastic a wealth of knowledge. He's an expert for so many years. I came uh, because I just wanted to uh, learn from Rick. Um, and I'm glad to see Steve Lobby is here. Steve is another uh, uh, experienced person uh, who, who's been buying and holding and also financial uh, wisdom uh, coaches as well. So, Rick. Thank you. Um, let's go around and introduce ourselves, talk about what you do, your background, and um, maybe what, what made you uh, interested in this topic. Start with you, George. Hello, everybody. I'm George Hadavio. I work as a technology consultant, and I've been doing real estate in one shape or form for about 10 years. I have about five rentals. And recently, I did my first commercial rehab from the ground up. And so I'm very interested in learning more about financing, partnering up to whatever extent I can with Rick. And I look forward to meeting him for one of you later. Um, Berlin, you want to go next? Okay. <clears throat> I'm Berlin Trout. Um, until recently, I worked for at and I just retired about six months ago. I've got time now, so I want to get into more into the investing. Great. I'm Sadrina Jalal. Um, I'm the executive director of a nonprofit, um, and my husband and I are just getting into investing. Cool. Uh, yeah, I'm Darahim Jalal. I'm a contractor for 20 years. And um, so my wife and I, we have, we have one building. I'm Mark McLaren. Um, I'm a cloud engineer. Actually, I uh, just transitioned over government contracts. I'm trying to take this time to um, realign my investment strategy. And uh, most of my investments have been in the stock market, but I know I need to diversify. So uh, it's just making time to, to get you know the wheels in motion in real estate. But I definitely want to get started. So I'm just real estate investing. Great. Uh, we'll start with you, John. Um, my name is John Gauthier. Um I've, I've done real estate in the past, actually a wholesale deal. I have to say I was comfortable with the fact that I all want to do. I just want to get more experience learning all aspects of real estate. And I just felt like that was a way to get me in. Okay. Mark? Okay. Right in the middle. Mark probably right here in the middle of everybody, so I'll rotate my head around. Uh, so I, I have some buy and holds, a few properties. I, uh, self-managed properties for a few decades. Um, I have more of a business earned income attitude towards real estate and appreciation. And I'm gonna show you guys how a lot of people have um, made money um, through real estate. Um, we're gonna go over the basic fundamental criteria and then we're gonna get complicated. And I'm going to go through it all, and some, some of you I'm going to bore, and some of you I'm going to lose it um, um, in the complexity of it all. But uh, hopefully this reaches a point where it's a learning experience for everyone. It's, you're, I expect everyone to have some sort of um, perspective shift during this because I'm going to show you a lot of different techniques and um, some of them have been new to me this year. So uh, it's fun, it's exciting, I, I love being a part of people's financial lives. It's very flattering and it's my privilege and pleasure. Um, so we're going to get started and uh, you guys should all have a book and we're going to go through uh, some fundamentals to begin with. And just like, you know, if we were coaching football, I would explain the field, and the objective is to run it from one end to the other. We all know that, but we're still going to lay some groundwork. 
and then we're going to get complicated by the end of the day. Tomorrow we're going to start going through specific asset management scenarios and um, start deriving at um, hypothetical or specific plans, whatever we feel like doing from a participation standpoint. All right? So buckle up, here we go. <clears throat> uh, I am a member of a, a number of boards and I have uh, licenses through NMLS and Department of Banking and the uh, uh, Florida Financial Department Regulations and NMLS. We're held to a high standard. I recommend licensed people in most scenarios. We're going to go over some definitions and terms, go over types of mortgages by interest rate and classes, seven strategies, two owner-occupied, two investor, two commercial, one creative commercial, and then tomorrow we're going to go more into uh, asset management, utilization, leveraging versus capitalization. Um, and then some of the intangibles, principal fitness, and what plan is right for you. This is also in your book. Definitions to be aware of. <clears throat> Go ahead and give all those a read, and I'm going to get my glasses from the car. <laughs> <clears throat> so this is a, a simple quiz, and um, we don't really need to write all of these up. But in order to calculate what the payment is, under N, you either put 30 years or 360 months, depending on how your calculator is set. First of all, when you download and run that financial calculator, you click TVM, cal time value um, calculator at the top. Yes, that is that one. That makes a difference. Yeah, that one. Um, finance guy gave me the payment on a five-year note that worked out to be the same payment that I was looking for at 4% on the three-year note. So he jumped my rate up into the teens when I was actually in there off at four. And what he did was super slick. He had the contracts in triplicate. I signed mine on the top. He ripped off the bottom, folded up, sealed it in an envelope, sealed the envelope, and handed me a sealed envelope and said thank you. And then I was like, then I got my, especially if they did it in duplicate, because they may not have gave you exactly what you think you thought you signed. Um, but I don't know how I could have done that. Besides that measure, there's not really much else I could have done to protect myself. Now, anyone have an answer on what the payment is at 4% on 290000 for 30 years? 1,036. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we need a, a little what numbers are going negative, which are positive numbers. Are pretty much manageable. So, um, are you guys putting in 30 years or 360 months under N? 360. Okay. And then interest mm -hmm. rates for present value 290. Um, Zero future value compute payment. Yep, $1384.50. Now for the next question, we're simply changing this to 3.875 and then calculating the next payment. I'm just I'm just out. Where do you take the payment? Why well, is the green button that says payment? The green button that says payment. That's not correct. Of course, I don't know. Might have to confuse you first or something. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Did you get it? Yeah. Okay. Yep. I just got lucky. I showed up. Dropping the rate by an eighth. 
change the one yeah. item. The others are in there. Even if you shut, if you get a calculator, even if you shut it off, everything will be in there mm -hmm. when you turn it back on. Mm -hmm. Four point one two five takes you to five forty eight. thousand dollars what's your interest rate Some money flowing in and some money flowing out. The so negative is cash outflow. It really yeah. doesn't care which one as long as one is negative. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Well, I just can't get the calculator. Put a negative there. It says negative, but what? Yeah. Um, yeah. So which, which one would be a negative? Payments. Because you received $290,000, you're making a $2,000 payment. So it's not doing a negative sign. On the app, not doing On the sign? app, uh, it's yeah, yeah. there it goes. There it goes, yeah. It's just Takes in a minute. Authentic, you got it. Okay, thank you. It just, you've got to do it a couple times before it comes up. Thank you. You got it? At least I got the right answer. <laughs> month for 10 years. So that's 120,000. Okay? Pays a thousand dollars a month for 10 years. It's 120. 1,000 times 120 is 120,000. What's the cash value of an annuity paying a thousand dollars per month for 10 years if the grand required yield is 12%? This will be good for you if you ever win the lottery. You have to decide if you want the annuity or the cash value. <clears throat> so in this scenario, your payments are positive $1,000. Yield is 12%. case we want to calculate the present value. How much? Okay. So that hundred and twenty thousand dollars is worth sixty nine thousand now. Maybe hundred and twenty thousand dollars over the ten years. What would you take? Would you take the $69,000 now, or would you take the $120,000 over 10 years? Well, if your rate of return for your investments is 12%, it's a wash. If your rate of return is higher than 12%, you take the cash. If it's less than 12%, you probably take the annuity. That's the scientific thought process. Okay, so what's the answer? 69000 Okay. 700 What was the answer for the one prior to that? 120000 no interest rate. I did it 5%. Cool. Nice. $120,000 now with no payments or AM worth in 10 years if your yield is 10%. $324,000. 
Okay. It depends on if you pay at the beginning of the period or the end of the period. Okay. What depends on that? I got the six nine seven hundred, but what you mean? Um. So present value is one hundred and twenty k. Future value is a question. Payments zero. Yield is ten percent. And term is ten years. The future value of this is. So what this should tell you is that $120,000 at a 10% consistent rate of return will bring in $324,000 in 10 years. That's a mathematical fact. <clears throat> so by manipulating any one variable, your outcome is different. Whether it be drawing a payment out or changing the rate of return, shortening or lengthening the, the number of, of months, and or changing the principal uh, present value of the original balance. These are the five factors. So become, become comfortable with, financial, with, with the financial calculator and the methods to arrive at those formulas. It's the foundation of finance. It's time, value, and money. So, the question is, how much is an interest-only payment on a $300,000 loan at 0% interest? Well, I'm looking at the wrong one. <laughs> you got one going. <laughs> <That's just laughs> Can I have one of those? Yeah. <laughs> I have it for okay. I don't think I have that question. question. It's right under the, the 220K, right? Where is so an interest-only loan at 0% interest has a zero payment. <laughs> Correct. And the balloon is 300000 And then the balloon would be 300000 So if you have an interest-only loan at 0%, your payment's is zero. You I had someone ask for that in negotiating owner finance at one time. It was hilarious. You don't offer that? <laughs> no. <laughs> Um, and then your balloon would be 300000 Okay, next question. It's kind of a trick question. If you're offered a $300,000 loan at 3.5 with a five-year balloon at 280000 what would the monthly payment be? I made this multiple choice. Um, so what happens is, is you'll calculate it straight out, and you'll arrive at A as an answer. But A is not the correct answer because your amortization schedule would take you down below two hundred eighty thousand. Well, so so you have to change your future value to two hundred eighty thousand and calculate the payment and change your term to sixty because it's a five-year delivery. And then your correct answer will be C. So, so within that is it's a, within that your ruling would is it is a five-year amortization schedule. Yes, it okay. would be because what we've done is we've manipulated the amortization because the balance would be lower uh, than 280 on a 30-year uh, AM at that interest rate. This is a good exercise to do um, some other time. Handout number one. Yeah, you can hand out those. Do you have the, um, the answers to all of them in case we want to recreate it? Um, Later on. Not really. Not got it. All right. Three types of mortgages. Okay, based on on um, interest rate classifications. Prime, soft money, and hard money. Fannie Mae has a definition of 
um, high cost and higher cost. Higher cost is anything that's um, uh, over the average offered prime rate by 2%, no more than 6%. So if the average offered prime rate is 4%, Fannie Mae's definition of higher cost is 6 to 10. Um, anything over 10 is not allowed on anything over owner-occupied, so it's cost, that's called high cost, um, also endearingly referred to as hard money. This middle category is often referred to as soft money. Qualify for owner-occupied loans, basically three criteria. We're going to assume that the property holds its own value that is not being over, overpaid for. So there's income, credit, and assets. Income, you have to debt to income ratio qualify. Credit, you have to meet or exceed the minimum standards. For FHA, it's like 580. For most conventional, it's 620. For most conventional investment, it's 660. But you'll get some hits under 700 on conventional investments. And anytime you, you push the envelope to the minimum criteria, the max loan to value, you'll get some negative adjustments on rate. And then assets. Assets, for our definition, is. Um, cash on hand, or stocks, bonds, anything liquidable, not cars, but 401ks, IRAs, things like that. Here's an example of qualifying income. I enjoyed this one, it's Trump-esque. Notice there's a negative $2 million carry forward loss. Oh, gosh. This person qualifies for whatever they want. They make $492,000. Carry forward loss is from uh, 2010. So when we calculate income, we exclude non reoccurring uh, uh, losses. Um, you know, our president's been doing this since probably 1990, 89. Uh, I think he had a $20 million carry forward loss. And he's been borrowing um, against his, his own equity appreciation. So borrowing is not considered income. So if you have a $100 million carry forward loss 20 years ago, and you keep buying buildings and borrowing against them, you don't have any income. So um, if anyone's wondering why our president doesn't pay taxes, it's because he doesn't have income by the IRS standards. And that's why a lot of investors have trouble selling property. A lot of investors just continue to accumulate property to avoid the tax consequence. There's a number of add backs also. Depreciation, depletion, mileage, business use of home. A, I had a customer one time that unfortunately spent uh, $100,000 to attend Than Merrill's course. Uh, I made fun of her a little bit until she wanted to kill me for making fun of her. And I never did it again because she, she loved the experience. But that was a non-reoccurring expense that I could add back. So although she had a negative uh, uh, business return on that aspect, I could add that back as well as depreciation, depletion, miles. Wow, it was 50 per member. So how much did you say she spent? Uh, 38, 48 on herself, and, four, and her husband spent 48. So, if you do a, but you know, it's, she loved the experience. I think she must have made three or four fantastic contacts 
You know, it's like maybe it's like uh, the equivalent of attending Harvard Law. You know, it may not be the best seven hundred thousand dollars you'll spend, but you'll make some fantastic relationships while you're there. I, I took it, but it was only twenty-two or twenty-four or something. And we were allowed to bring five people. We only brought two. Mm -hmm. but we split it fifty-fifty. What year was that? It was just before I started private money laundering. Must have been laundering. You mean lending? Oh yeah. <laughs> must have been two thousand nine. I took this class in two thousand nine. I, I think I spent uh, over the weekends for like two or three thousand dollars. Yeah. Yeah. This was two thousand fifteen. We took his, we took his course. It was me and my, my son, my ex-son. Mm -hmm. And I got, I got my private money lending customers out of That's what I did. Private I mean, we've got an event coming up next month, Life in Air. It's, uh, you know, their, their premier package is $5,000. And for some people who want to master time management, they're going to go to the woods and they're going to kumbaya three times a year. Mm -hmm. And they're going to come back refreshed, revived, and happy they spent it. Cheaper than a cruise? <laughs> it can be. So, um, uh, you know, I, I think we all share the same perspective of, of not appreciating the, the people who don't do what they can, but I keep an open mind as far as the guru department is concerned. So, um, we have. Uh, uh, agency guidelines allow us to add back certain things, and this is on owner-occupied residential or Fannie Mae Freddie Mac investment. Now, if you can go full documentation where your income qualifies you for um, uh, uh, to buy property, you will have the cheapest closing costs and the lowest interest rates going conventional. Um, we're normally paid by lender outside of closing on those, so our cost to our customers is free on that. Uh, and it's made up in a, in a small interest rate increase. Um, third party closing costs are usually around 2500 and then you get your impounds. So if your income qualifies you to buy real estate, Fannie Freddie is the cheapest way to do investment. FHA is arguably the cheapest way to do owner occupied. The interest rates are lower, so the first three to five years, um, if you took two people that put the same down payment and were paying the same mortgage insurance, uh, um, the FHA loan would be cheaper during the first three to five years, unless someone puts more down on a conventional loan. Two people with the same down payment. Um, FHA would, would, would win as far as the cost of borrowing. Now, in three to five years, you may be able to drop your mortgage insurance on a conventional loan, so the, con the Fannie Freddie product would start to pull away for that reason. But FHA loans in general are a full half percentage below um, conventional loans right now. And if you look at uh, an example that's been handed out, this is example one. Freddie Mac, so most everyone goes Fannie Mae. Freddie Mac is kind of a pain, their portal, you have to enter everything manually, so no one really goes Freddie Mac, but Freddie Mac is great for the self-employed. They like, uh, Freddie likes higher assets, and he'll allow you to do a conventional loan with one year's returns. So Fannie is always a two-year average, Freddie will let you do one year. Business the most recent or the best of two? The most recent. And if it's, um, it, so you could, at this time, you could use 2017s, because 2017s are allowed to be on extension till the middle of October. But if you close on October 16th, your 2017s will be required. Mm. Um, so, uh, we've covered all of these. Moving on to basic credit types. A plus, A, B, and C. There you are. Let's talk about 
technique one, which is the most basic, the stronghold. Someone buys a house, plants a flag, pays it off. Okay? Let's take a look at this example. This is a real settlement statement. In example one, Dragonfly Lane, and here's the CD. Since the Dodd-Frank Act, closings are now called consummations. They're not called closings anymore. Jeez. And we don't no longer use HUDs on a uh, uh, closing, because it's not a closing, it's a consummation. So now you use CDs, which sucks because the HUDs were so clear and easy to follow. <laughs> this particular customer um, paid a small discount, and uh, we were paid outside of closing. And their interest rate was 3.625. 3.625 isn't bad on an FHA deal with uh, no, no closing costs. This house was bought for $350,000 on November 1st, 2017. And let's assume Zillow's estimates correct at 371. How much has this property gone up in value? So, back to our calculators for a minute. 21,000 is 6% of 350,000, and we're not even in November. But let's assume that we are in November. So this is more like 7% appreciation that we're seeing here in Atlanta, over seven. Um, but we've had a big jump. It's not gonna sustain. There's no way to keep that growth that high. But I think 5% is a safe level of appreciation considering what's going on in this, in this city, with um, probably the Super Bowl next year, the Mercedes Stadium, 22 um, mixed-use commercial developments happening in West Midtown and Northwest Midtown, another couple dozen industrial developments in Stone Mountain and Gwinnett, the next Avalon happen, happening by uh, um, uh, 85 near Mala, Georgia, uh, uh, Amazon's distribution center going in Stone Mountain. So, <clears throat> we're about as happening as it gets as far as the, the uh, um, United States is concerned. You know, I wouldn't want to, you know, live in anywhere else. Florida's kind of not been the best place to continue to move, but it's growing. You know, a lot of the growth is being taken from the Northeast. So, I think we all should be comfortable and confident in appreciation happening in Atlanta and I'm happy to see it. We've got it going on here. So again I'm going to be boring some people with this but I'll make it up to you in the end I promise. Um, income, must have income to qualify below 50 percent. So Five eighty minimum score. Three and a half percent down. What's that four K or eight K minimum in that first uh, check I, price? I don't know what happened there. Four or eight K minimum. I I don't know. Disregard that. Okay. Uh, I, possibly what I was thinking is if you have a $4,000 um, payment, you, you'll need a minimum of $8,000 in income. Disregard that. So 50% of the DTI is for an FHA, uh, that's the max they'll go to? 50% DTI is the max you'll, it, well, two. If you have a million dollars in a 55% DTI, you'll get accepted at 55, especially Freddie Mac. Freddie Mac likes high assets and will allow for higher DTI, especially with self-employed. Um, and then there's also Fannie Mae has a criteria of diminishing assets, uh, which will allow you to take the million dollars 
and divide it by the number of years and then add that back to income. Or if you set up an annuity, which is continuous for at least three years, you could add that back dollar for dollar. So that's the requirement is that things have to be continuous for at least three years, including child support, for example, for women. For, the diminishing, asset, for, either, uh, for the diminishing asset strategy, does a 401k uh, count, even though you might be uh, younger than 57 and a half? If it's paying. No, I was right, but say, yeah. hey, was just, if it's, it has to be actually paying. Okay, so they have to be over 57 and a half on the ticket distribution. Okay. Yeah. At four percent appreciation, the three hundred thousand dollar house is worth how much in thirty years? Do you guys have your financial calculators? You can answer that question. The car costs at thirty years. At five percent appreciation, it'll hit a million dollars in roughly twenty four years. At 6% appreciation, you'll hit a million dollars in roughly 20 years. And at 8% appreciation, we're looking at roughly 15 years. If you put this same note on the applicable amortization schedules, you can arrive at a million dollars in 15, 20, or 30 years, depending on which schedule you, you picked. And then, of course, your equity is um, the difference between your, 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 your property value and your loan value. Now, of course, you have to, you'll have a negative cash outflow unless you have border income because this is your primary residence. And this is why a lot of your investors don't like owning primary residence. Stronghold strategy overview is it's very safe, conservative, good for the working person. Key, key statement there is working person, earning income. Um, doesn't mean that you can't move, but the yeah, idea is that you need to pick up where you left off to arrive at whatever goal you set yourself depending on your age, for the performance of this asset. No general contract experience required. Pitfalls include loss of job, loss of renters for a quad, a little loss of opportunity cost. Aversions include negative PITI cash flow, excluding border incomes. So the Millennium example was fantastic. You know, a kid, 25-year-old kid could get a job, quit it, and get a house while he has his job and fill it up with his buddies and he could be a millionaire by 40. Right. Border meeting like... Rent. Borders or roommates. Okay. Or an Airbnb or something. Yeah. 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 Print out is three Fannie Mae quads that we did. It looks like this, out of number two. I also include the HUDs with these. Uh, on the residential stuff, it's kind of boring, but it gets exciting when we get in the SBA stuff at the end. But I, I like to show you guys that we really do these, these, these deals, and this is what they look like. So around the same period of time that Someone qualifies for a 3.625 primary residence, then you get a 5.125 Fannie Mae investment property. Rates have gone up a solid three quarters of a percentage since this time, so uh, right now we're looking more like 5.875 with the same criteria. With no, uh, no broker or lender fees, or very little broker or lender fees. These units, were $160,000 each. Or four eighty dollars for the package. Yeah, that's for the quad. That's for four each quadruplex is, was $160,000. Right. So 40 per unit. Yes. Rent 
at six hundred dollars per unit. We're going to reduce that total revenue of sixteen hundred by twenty percent. So we're going to talk about cap rate. <clears throat> this building rents for sixteen hundred gross revenue. Minus I'm sorry. Six hundred units. Six hundred unit twenty four hundred. Yeah. Thank you. You're just stepping this. Yeah. Good job. Good catch. Twenty four hundred times eighty percent of that. No, three eighty nine hundred, right? Okay, let's go ahead and take it. Just use forty thousand per unit. Yeah. Let's go ahead and take it take your right. Let's go ahead and do them all together. So it's six hundred per unit. Let's multiply that times twelve. So we're going to call that our, our net operating income, our NOI. Okay? Our value so we'll annualize that. So the annual net operating income is sixty-nine thousand one twenty. Okay. Our value is one hundred and sixty per unit times three. rate the first three years because it's assumed that the maintenance has brought, been brought up to par um, on inception. But this is more of an exercise in knowing the cap rate and being able to analyze it than it is than agreeing with this cap rate. Yeah. Yeah. So um, when you, when you um, take the NOI and you divide it by the value you arrive at the cap rate. Now the cap rate is a fantastic tool for arriving at the value of a property. If you take the profits, the NOI, and divide it by the cap rate you think it's worth, for example, class A buildings are usually at 5%, maybe as high as 7. Class B buildings, maybe 8, 9, 10, 11 depending on how nice it is, your class C buildings are 12 to 15, you can arrive at the value. So let's say Kurt and I are looking at this building. And Kurt says, you know, I think, you're, I think you're, your books are juiced. I don't think your NOI is uh, <clears throat> 69,120. I think... Uh, I think it's less. I think it's 40000 But I do agree with your cap rate. What has he done? He is now telling me that my building is worth almost a third less. If Kurt's saying, 
my expenses are really 20 grand more and I'm cooking my books. But he's agreeing with my cap rate. That drops the um, building value to uh, 266,000. For all three? Yeah. About four each. It, it drops the building to 266,000. Or 88,000 building. So, if you're ever in the hotel business, they're constantly cooking their books to increase the, the occupancy because the business is worth three and a half. It's worth a factor of their profitability. So, restaurants, hotels, that's the, that's the challenge in interpreting the financials to determine the real value once you've determined the cap rate. So, he would say this is a C building, possibly a C minus building, I agree with your cap rate. Now, if I wanted to push back with Kurt in a negotiating standpoint, I'd say, you know, we just uh, planted a bunch of rose bushes in the, in the front, Kurt. I'd say this is, a, this is like an 11 cap. So then, I'll say, you know what, you caught us. We are cooking the books. But we're not a 14 cap because we got a new roof and some rose bushes out front. We're an 11 cap. So instead of dividing it by 14.4, Let's divide that by 11. What happens to our value? It goes up. So. Up to 49,120. Divide that by 0.11. 446. Mm -hmm. Higher the cap rate, the lower the value. Rick, one thing that I, I mean, I feel silly saying this because I can do the spreadsheets, but I've never got my head around what, I've never got my head around cap rate, and I think you're addressing this, and maybe hit it, just to say it one more way, mm -hmm. is that you're basically arguing over whether you think this is a crappy building or a good building, right? So, Both from this perspective of the class of the tenant, the amenities yeah. and all that, it's yeah. appreciation potential in the neighborhood, but also in terms of its income, in terms of its income, right? If I walk into a beautiful building with a concierge and mar uh, marble floors and walls, and, um, it's pristine. I expect them to be selling at a four and a half, five and a half percent cap. If I walk into a class B building, but it has an elevator, I'm thinking we're at a, a six or seven cap. Doesn't have an elevator, maybe an eight or nine cap. 10, the best. And then uh, class C buildings, it's kind of a wild card, anywhere from 10 to 20. I've got an example of one at the end of this that's in the high 20s. <clears throat> but it's a beaten dog. <laughs> okay? And is cap ever, like, the argument over cap ever, if you're in a rapidly gentrifying area, you know, how are they pitching that as far as, well, this is today's cap rate, but you could be at this, and we're selling it based on what we think. You know, this is a, this is a burned out, half-occupied quad, but it's in Vine City and they're going to be doing this stuff or it's mm -hmm. a block or you know, this type of stuff. How are they pitching that and how should you interpret, be swayed and not swayed by that argument in future, future, future value? You don't get a lot of arguments about your cap rate's going to go down because your property is going to appreciate. You normally get a, a standalone sales pitch about the property appreciation. The big difference between a quad and a single family and a stronghold is that there's positive cash flow. I recommend this for um, um, people who have diminishing income or want to create more of a passive income relationship. Now, if you were to say you 
you had positive cash flow of two thousand dollars. Well, we could actually take a look at the cash flow on this deal as it was actually done. There's, you have the CDs. You can see that the PITI payment on each one of these units is $884 and four, $888 and 41 cents. So, if we have 881, I'm sorry, 888, as the monthly rental income. <clears throat> now let's say you participate in Moby's philosophies of reinvesting your net operating income into the stock market. If you have $2,000 in positive cash flow, and you reinvest it in the stock market at 8%. I'd say it's 6%. Calculators. Let's put a payment of negative 2,000 in. Zero present value. 10 years, compute future value. At si Since the class is seven ways to a million, a million dollars Six percent. At eight percent, that is another aspect that you can calculate if instead of using the income, you reinvest it in another instrument. The house hopper is a technique for um, where, where someone moves to a new house every year. It's not, um, there's nothing wrong with it. It requires a lot of moving. A lot of people do it. It's the best approach to gaining wealth because you're financing terms are the best as an owner occupier. So, this is actually the best approach and the least expensive to obtaining wealth, and I call it the house hop. And it's basically because you're maximizing your leveraging at uh, a very low cost of borrowing, and um, it allows you to. Uh, um, finance multiple properties and gain multiple appreciation. So each one of these is the appreciation of this particular property. So if this person buys 12 houses every year, each one of those 12 houses will appreciate to a million dollars eventually. Uh, I think our first chart showed that that would happen in 20 years on average. So from year 20 to year 32, that's a million 
dollars fully um, uh, appreciated and continuing to appreciate. You consolidate these charts. Something like that, where you can read the future value and the amortization schedule per property, and merge them onto a chart. I didn't want to torture you guys and bore you that much, so I just went ahead and gave you an idea of what it looked like. But if you really wanted to graph that out, um, it would take you to a good level of understanding on that. There's debt being incurred from year one to 12. So the debt rises, so the debt rises to um, under uh, 4 million, and then it amortizes down. This curve could be a little lower. And the equity continue appreciates to over 20 million in a 32 year plan. Uh, it allows you to think about multiple touches in multiple properties. Um, a lot of investors are trying to gather as many properties as possible because we're in an appreciating market. And this is the mathematics behind that rationale. Now when we get more into investment strategies on slot three and four, you'll see how that works a little bit differently. Okay, um, the next two slides are based on So, if potentially you could generate $2,000 a month in rental income from this multifamily project that we just saw, and you were able to acquire 10 of these, that would be $20,000 a month in passive income. I don't know if we can call it passive, because you're going to be a busy guy filling up all these units. But that is $20,000 a month in passive income. This particular loan, um, these were cash out refinances, bought with hard money, renovated, and then cash out refinanced to pull back the um, down payment initially, which is a good strategy too, which we'll talk more about after the break. But the rental income aspect on 12 acquisitions at $2,000 a month is $24,000 in passive income a month. Are we talking about way three now? No, we're still talking about way two. Got it. But we're adding a multifamily aspect to it. If instead of acquiring single family, you're acquiring uh, quads or multifamily, it adds a higher um, net revenue aspect to it. So basically what you're saying is with the house hopper is, is that he would be moving from one quad to another quad each year. Yes. Got it. You think so occupying. Yes. He would one, occupy one. the next one that he purchased. Yeah. Correct. For that purpose of that example, not understanding. Yes. Is the occupying, when I think of that, it makes me think, oh, okay, well, you can just roll the tax, you can keep deferring taxes on it, is that a substantial portion of being able to reach this goal? It is. Um, well, you don't have the taxes on the, on the uh, you don't have the capital gains taxes until you actually sell it. Right. Uh, you will have um, income taxes, and this isn't a tax class, right. um, but I'll share what I know. Uh, now, Steve, you can reinvest the rental income without any tax consequence, if I understand you told me that works. Can you reinvest the rental income towards your mortgage without any tax consequence? Well, no, because no. you're going to have less and less interest every month, so your deduction is going to go down. Right. But your so cash flow should be mostly sheltered from depreciation for mm -hmm. the short term. Please so. But, yeah. Yeah. but, 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 but let's get, I, I, don't, I right. don't advocate putting your cash flow into the stock market. Let me okay. clarify. I advocate putting your cash flow into a core five or ten properties to make sure you're going to be financially independent in eight or ten years. And then if you still like real estate and if eight or ten properties isn't enough for you, you leverage the crap, do this kind of thing for your other properties. 
And then, if you get, when you actually analyze the math of what happens when they're paid for, that's when I say you really should just be in stocks because once they're paid for, once the leverage is gone, the return is crappy. Mm -hmm. So um, that's where I am. Like, like this example right here, you get 200000 a month cash flow, which is $2.4 million a year. You've also got $20 million of paid for houses. You put it in the stocks, you get $2 million a year. You don't have tenants to throw some trash. Yeah. Strokes. It is. But you, you leverage yeah. like this, the kind of things he's talking about, leveraging, 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 there's no question you build wealth in a very, very strong, fast manner. You could not build that much wealth without this sort of a mechanism because it would take the 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 returns are much higher. Um, for example, the investor who bought into this strategy came into it all with less than um, forty thousand dollars to begin with. You know, forty thousand dollars at ten percent, even if that is your constant rate of return over several years won't generate the same cash flow that a income generating property has the potential to do. A leveraged income. Leveraged, yeah. A leveraged it's, it's income. It's amazing to leverage this way in real estate. It's yes. Amazing. And we'll go through some leveraging slides too. But yes, you're, you're able to capture the um, exponential opportunities of, of income generation through leveraging. And um, we're going to take a, a 10 minute break in um, just a minute and go over uh, commercial investment strategies and then business investment strategies. Uh, does anyone have any questions so far about what we've covered? Pat? Candidly, this last one, I can ask you offline if you're not, not quite cross. So, not quite cross. basically, um, if you've acquired 12 properties mm -hmm. in, um, in, in 12 years, the, the cash flow of $2,000 a month times 12 is 24000 Okay. In 32 years, the um, appreciation of those properties with the rental increases, maintaining a 1% um, gross rental rate, brings the rental cash flow to $200,000 a month. And that's based on the $20 million of property. Yeah. yeah, that's based on $20 million of property. And this is, a, presume, a, a certain rate of appreciation for this market? Um, that would be at six uh, percent. And this is not this is not speaking to whether or not you're putting the excess cash flow on those mortgages that are or not. If uh, right, no, this is. Um, That's this not addressing is, that. Right. Living a lavish lifestyle on the positive cash flow. I mean, you could. You'd have a lot of positive cash flow. You'd have a lot of. And what's the rental income to the value line? Yeah, it works. <laughs> what's that? Where you yeah, properly? Well, Chris Manley can spend it as my daughter. <laughs> what is the rental income reinvestment value line? Um, that is the if you didn't turn it into cash flow, if you took all the money and you invested it into an instrument that got you a return, that is this line. So Every year, your rent would go up, your property values are going up. The $24,000 a month, the next year would be $26,000, the following year would be $28,000, and so on. If you were to take the time to factor all the future values of that cash flow, it would reach um, a about 20 million in roughly 16, 17 years. Yeah, but if you reinvested that cash flow into paying down the debt, right. you reach that point much quicker. Um, not if you're 
investment cost is higher than your interest rate. Which rate money is still cheaper. So, I mean, the simplistic way to look at this, you got $20 million of paid for property. If it were 10 cap, you'd have $2 million of income. Right. He's got it basically 1% a month, and it works out to be 12 cap. That's right. It's an oversimplified way to get your hands around one concept in the future value of money. Rick, you're, you're buying one rental a, a year. Uh, those are conventional um, uh, occupant loans. Mm -hmm. All right, right. So uh, the analog in the FHA world is you buy a, an FHA occupant home every two years with only 5% down. And that's the best deal in rental real estate. It's 3.5% down. And the restriction is that FHA may not approve you for two FHA loans in two years. Um, unless they're more than 50 miles apart, you can prove you're relocating. But you don't necessarily have to get an FHA loan to participate in the house offer. You can do a conventional loan or an FHA loan. And um, the, the conventional loans have a couple, Fannie Mae came out with Home, home, Poss home Ready, and Freddie Mac has Home Possible. Those are both 3% down. And, um, this can be used as a single family investment or it can be used as a multifamily investment. I just wanted to add the multifamily aspect to it for people who are interested in that. And, and being positive cash flow on your occupant uh, property. So uh, I'm learning something here. So uh, the adage, buy a house every two years with FHA, uh, all in Atlanta is not possible because uh, FHA. Um, you can buy a house with FHA every year as long as um, it doesn't seem like you're um, manipulating it. For example, if you go to a larger house because you need a family and you have the uh, um, FHA loan and you want to keep it and you want to get another FHA loan, it's up to the underwriter. Um, if, you're, if you're relocating because of your business, um, uh, you'll always have the ability to get a second FHA. Right, but the, yeah, this is the house hopper strategy. And so I was two years ever in this equation? Because I, I always heard two years. Yeah, you can get rejected for an FHA loan um, if you're if if you're not moving <clears throat> far enough away. If it's a very similar house, because there's going to be occupancy concerns about the second FHA loan. No, you're definitely going to occupy it. No, the whole purpose yeah. is you're going to occupy it. Yeah, but you have to prove that you're going to occupy it, and that's hard to do. I'm assuming, like, for me, Mary, kids, the Gator school system, we're not going to do this. This house hopper is similar to your strategy that you talked about, Steve. Study acquisition, keep your day job, study acquisition of properties. But that's kind of what I was getting at before. Like, I, you know, I would be divorced if I tried to house hop with my family and stuff. That's just not where yeah. we're at in our life right now. But we can still as, as execute the same strategy. It just has a different tax consequence and maybe push out a few more years to reach that goal. Am I reading that right? Yeah. You can do, um, this is just the owner-occupied version of the um, buying investment properties and short-term homes, which is uh, number four. But it's just the <laughs> cheapest way. I mean, the it's the, it's use the, the cheapest FHA way. Method, yeah. there's something. We don't have to use the FHA for every deal. Correct. And you, you can go conventional and also. So you, to your point, Kurt, you can do it every year, but you probably pay a little more and more conventional versus FHA. Right. 80% LTV and, right. No, it's, 90, no. it's 95 and 97 if it gets proved home ready or home, home possible. If it, you're legitimately going to move. I'm trying to wrap my head around the debt to income ratio issue here. Do you want that or do you look at this closely? It seems yeah. to me you'd run into a debt to income wall. You would you do three percent down, five percent down. Yeah, you'll have to qualify each time. And, um, so it depends on what you make and what your lifestyle is and how much debt you carry. Now you can count um, leasing your property um, on some on, on some of the conventional loans and FHA loans 
when you uh, when you move, even even if you don't use a. Um, I, I would steer away from the Schedule E and then start using more of an, uh, a Schedule C um, when, you, when you move the properties, when you move to an, uh, uh, another property and tra transfer the ownership to an LLC or, or a uh, um, different type of, hold the title in a corporation. And then um, structure the income so you're not using a Schedule E so that you're using a, uh, so that 100% of your income can be counted. This isn't an income class, but if I was doing the house hopper, I would be uh, titling over the properties into the corporation's name um, uh, and using the net income so I could count 100% of it, so, so the mortgage wasn't counting against me. And then I would be proving that the mortgage payments was being paid through the LLC, and then um, I would be offsetting my DTI. Schedule E um, income is, is reduced by 25% is why you, you, you schedule C. The process problem, income versus schedule E. The problem with the schedule E is um, because everyone uses a lot of maintenance and then beats down their, their, their income number, I think. But yeah, but let's just, and I get to add back depreciation and depletion um, and uh, interest because it's being counted against you. So when you have a Schedule E, you'll have, um, let's say $1,000 is your, is your uh, PITI payment. Um, and then you've got $100 where you deduct the interest, right? Mm -hmm. And then you've got uh, the rental income here, let's say, what do you want to say the rental income is? 1200 1200 all right. So when I'm doing your DTI, 100% of this, of this debt gets counted against you, right? So if you make, if you make $5,000 a month, and on your rental properties, and you have ten thousand dollars in income, you're at a you're already your DTI is already maxed out, not even counting your primary residence. Let me see how I can explain this. So, so let me see if I get this right. So, I mean, this is the problem I run into. I yeah. have a D to I problem, which yeah. blows my mind. Yeah. Not that I want to buy any more property anyway, but if you put it in a in a C corp, mm -hmm. then you just got the bottom line profit or loss from the C corp. Yes. They don't do the summation of all your debts to do the No. Right? Right. Exactly. Right. And then you just show right. that the corporation's paying the liability. Right. And then even if you're making a little bit of money, it's complementary to your DTI, as opposed to having to make twice as much money as your rental income to not even qualify it with a 50% debt to income ratio before you consider the factor of your next property. Well, and that's why the schedule, schedule E. So all of the PITI comes uh, on my debt side. Exactly. But what's happening to that 1200 rent? Why isn't that going to my income side? Because m even if it did, your debt to income ratio is like 80% from that piece alone. Right. And it shouldn't be counted that way because um, it's, business, it's a business transaction. And the Schedule E makes it a personal liability. So even if you do count the hundred, the entire amount, which you're not because you're taking maintenance, and I even add back depreciation and depletion, then and you have a thousand dollar payment, you know, uh, there'd be a thousand dollars divided by twelve hundred. Your debt income ratio is what eighty percent for this piece. So you got to take a weighted average of each one of these, and then somehow you're gonna have to dwindle down to below fifty before we even considering our subject property. Well, with W-2 income, right? right. Yeah. So you have to have a W-2 income in order to make Or money. business income and the, um, and the uh, adjusted gross income is treated the same way. Hmm. You know, we'll, we'll add all your business income transactions. So that's why the Schedule E requires such a heavy income load to even get down to below 50%. Now, can, can, Rick, if, oh, go ahead, Steve. I'm sorry. 
Uh, a simple way to illustrate it, just look at one one property. Mm -hmm. If you if you get a typical ten cap property, you get twelve hundred dollars income, which means you only have eight hundred NOI. Then typically with the mortgage, and I, I'm used to working with twenty percent down, not three percent down. Your mortgage payment is going to be four five hundred a month. So your cash flow, your income is going to be three or four hundred a month, and your debt was also four hundred a month. So your debt to income ratio for that one property is a hundred percent. Yeah. And every time you buy another property, it, yeah. dra it drags your debt to income ratio higher and higher and higher. And it doesn't take more than six or seven properties, and you can't qualify. Well, let's take a break. But I'm open for questions. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, Rick, if you were doing the uh, quad sort of thing. You're not really having to worry about DTI, assuming that all your, your units well, are occupied. One to four family is still residential. Right. Um, I know. Yeah. So it, it's, it, it, it can be treated the same way. Right. But, on a schedule eight. but because you're having more cash flow, theoretically, by having units, if you structure it properly, then you probably are having less of a DTI issue. I don't know. Probably, you have more experience. Probably less, but still a bad DTI issue because you have a two to one debt service coverage ratio is a great ratio, right? Right. Let's say you have twenty thousand dollars in rental income and ten thousand dollars in mortgage payments, and you're not deducting any maintenance. Right. You don't qualify for anything. You're already at fifty percent DTI. Right. And you make one hundred and twenty thousand dollars a year passively. If you did that with a Schedule C or an 1120S through an LLC, now you have a zero DTI with the same liabilities, if you have no other liabilities, and $120,000 adjusted gross income um, through a K-1, which has a lower tax consequence, and then um, you can buy anything within reason. Right. Even Not, without a W-2 jar. I, I yeah. see what you're doing there. I, I see it. So, well, and, if, and if you go Freddie Mac, you can do that with one year's tax return. So we're two hours in, I already learned a few things. Thank you. Yeah. Now, so one, one other question I have in regards to, let's say you're doing the house hopper, but from a quad sort of concept, mm -hmm. quad to quad, quad to quad. Yeah. Is this, are you still limited to that 50 mile radius sort of thing from quad to quad? Uh, okay, so FHA, all right, will allow you to buy a house um, within two years. Right. Um, if you have a good reason for moving, if you have a, 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 right. a reasonable reason for moving, or if you need to upgrade because you have more kids or downsize because you're an empty nester. Right. Now, 50 miles away is a great reason. A new right. job within 50, 50 right. miles away is a fantastic reason. Right. And, but, but FHA is the strictest about that. Right. You also can go conventional Fannie or Freddie. Right. So if you went conventional Fannie or Freddie, using the quad hop, house hopper concept. Yeah. I'm just doing a what if here. Sure. Is this, are you still limited to that 50 mile range limitation? Uh, no. Okay. So theoretically, and you know quads, they usually are grouped. So theoretically, you could buy one quad here, and you could buy the next quad next door if it were to become available at the right price. Theoretically, yes, but you'll have to satisfy occupancy concerns because occupancy misrepresentation was the number one fraud of Oh, no, you would move from that quad to the next quad. Yeah, I know that you plan on moving, and we believe you, you plan on moving, but you have to present an argument on why you plan on moving, such as uh, my units rented would be good supporting documentation. Okay, so, so I'm still confused. So, so the first quad that you bought, or duplex or whatever, was owner-occupied. Then you're going you're gonna to do the house up, then you're going to move out of there. Mm -hmm. And that owner-occupied loan is not on a rental property. So right. You know, is that cricket? Is that? No, there's no. The, the, the terms are not negotiable. You're well within your rights to, to, to change your, your ownership or uh, title it to uh, uh, something that makes sense, or uh, decide to rent it. It's all, it's all within yeah, your so rights. So you can keep time? Yeah, so following on six, six months? Just, at least wait six months, but a year is fine. It's called a valid change of circumstance. Right. And so you're, you're allowed to, to manipulate things that way. So using Steve's question that I had there, so you can use that owner-occupied strategy that you acquired that first quad 
and keep it as an owner-occupied loan, mm -hmm. even though you, the next year, under your scenario here, you're buying another quad as an owner-occupied, assuming you can verify and all the other stuff. Let's that get that out of the way. Yes. And still keep the first one as an owner-occupied loan, the second one as an owner-occupied loan, and you could just repeat every, theoretically, every year after that. Yes. Got it. And my teaching method is to show an extreme example yeah. and then point it out. So it's not necessarily a identical roadmap, it's just one um, extreme possibility. Understand. Most of us can live on less than 2.4 million a year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Most of, maybe not right. Steve. We'll take a break. <laughs> that was purchased. What is the LTV? 96.5. And um, what would be the minimum income to DTI qualified for this? And let's say they have no other houses and they're W 2 employees and have no other debts. So the total monthly PITI payment, if you look on the closing disclosure, is $22.96. If they have no other monthly debts, I would, I would double that. So that would be 4600 would be the minimum monthly income to qualify them. Um, now I know people have complicated income scenarios and I'll be happy to dissect those individually and that'll come with your, you know, that'll be part of the things we look at. It would be too time consuming to do that in a group session. Um, but uh, uh, there's, there's basic calculations for that, and I'll, I'll be happy to show them all to you. I, I even have an Excel spreadsheet that uh, shows you how to calculate um, income. I can show you that now. And, and anyone who wants that can, can have it. Yes. <laughs> <clears throat> the cash to close came to 12610 on this transaction. And uh, yeah, it does look like they paid the... Um, now, FHA charges 2 point, you know, 1.75% in the mortgage insurance. And that, yeah, and that counts as closing costs. Also, um, Tax and insurance impounds is counted as closing costs, and they're not really, they're a depreciating asset. Um, so that's often included in closing costs. And then, yes? So, I'm sorry, can we generalize this so that the minimum required will be the amount needed to close the deal? He doesn't have to have any other assets, checking accounts, IRAs, yeah. net worth, nothing. Right. It's the minimum amount to close. FHA Whatever. does not require reserve tax. Yeah. No, just, just as down payment. Right. Yeah, just down payment. Down payment. Close. Now, Fannie Freddie requires six months reserves per investment property. And three months oftentimes on the primary. The minimum credit And FHA only does that on So the minimum assets, so you could have seller paid closing costs and only be required to have three and a half percent on that FHA transaction. And that's lesser earnest money. Minimum credit scores, the next question, that's 580. Oh, Would this make a good hold? Depends on the rent. Exactly. <laughs> now, in my opinion, a good hold, if you're borrowing the money, is based on debt service coverage ratio. If you're paying with cash, it's based on cap rate. A good hold, it's a good hold if it has a 1.5 to 1 or better debt service coverage ratio, which means that $1,500 <coughs> in rental income to per $1,000 in PITI payment, net rental income. To, to per $1,000 in PITI payment is a 1.5 to 1 debt service coverage ratio. And at 1.5, 1,500 NOI. I put that on the whiteboard. So PITI is exclusive or inclusive? 
1.5 to 1 DSCR. That means that PITI, the, um, I'm sorry. The net rent divided by the PITI payment is 150%. So my net rent, you mean NOI, right? That's what they use. Yes. Yeah, NOI. So it's worth 70%. NOI is kind of a funny word if you're talking about one property, but net rent, rent minus your management and maintenance expenses. A lot of times during the first three years, we use the total rent because it's occupied and there's properties in good condition. Do they include a vacancy, a vacancy estimate? Or we don't normally do that on the first three years. If it's occupied and it's um, in A plus condition, We'll, we'll even base, during the first three years, we'll base that on the total rent in the lending industry as a standard operating procedure. Total rent. So what's the expected rent on, what would you guys guess the expected rent on a house like this in Loganville would be? Right. I hope it's at least 3500 would you think it would be 3,500? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody give me a number. 3444. I'll give you 4920. <laughs> you think of rent for that much? No, but that's one and a half times the DSR if you take 70% of the risk. Let's take a realistic number. 3,400. 3,400. 2,400. Let's go with 3,000. How about that? All right. Okay. Yeah, let's go with 3,000. 3,000 rent. What's the PITI? 2296. What's our coverage ratio? Wait, wait, wait. Aren't you going to take this my point? Aren't you going to take 70% no. of that rent? No, you're not. Because we're within the first three years. Yeah. It's a it's a brand new purchase. We've already had inspected. Mm -hmm. We know there's no maintenance for three years. Well, really? Well, that's the assumption in the industry. And um, if this was a uh, move out, let's assume that there's a rental a rent in there, and we're basing that on 100% of the rent. <clears throat> in the future, we're not going we're gonna we're not gonna consider rental increases. So we're looking at this now in this point in time with this that factor. That's how it's actually done for purchases. One point three uh, to one GOCR. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Well, not good, but good enough to pass the underwriting. Right. Yeah. It's good enough to pass underwriting. One point three. So, a lot of your California-based lenders um, have a one point one to one minimum DSCR. Most of your commercial lenders have a 1.3 to 1 minimum DSCR. I think 1.5 to 1 should be your basic criteria as a pass-fail. I personally wouldn't go after anything that's not 2 to 1 or better. So pass-fail criteria, in my opinion, and then 2 to 1 is the goal. How accurate do you find uh, the Zestimate rental estimation? Um, um, it? It's all over the place. Yeah, it's all over the place. Yeah. Where did it come out? Oh, I didn't look that oh. I'm about to look that one up. Yeah. Zestimate's got this, uh, I don't know. But yeah, the, the, I don't know. Yeah, I didn't check that. On, on handout two, we had some questions also. On bottom handout two. If the value is 160,000 per unit, total revenue is 600 per unit. Okay, we calculated the cap rate on that. 
what's the debt service coverage ratio? Two point one six if you use my numbers for DSCR. Um, if you use Kurtz, my minus of oh, forty percent. Small fly in the ointment on the quad day. Yeah, 43 20. I see in the closing docks that uh, it looks like landlord paid water bill, so that'll jack up uh, expense ratio. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's like a $40,000 water bill on that deal. Gotcha. Water. Um, how you look at this last deal, it could be good or great, um, or fair or, or very good, depending on what the operating expenses are. Can we, can we just back this truck up? Yes. So it's 888 per quad. You have to put 30% down, you've only got a 112 loan, correct? It's actually a cash out refinance, but yeah. So it's 888 times 3, which is what you got for the denominator. So that's all three quads. So the numerator has got to be all three quads worth of rent. It is. is. Yeah. It's got a 600 per unit times 12 units. Okay, I thought we were going to live in one. Shouldn't be 11. What? Right. Okay. Alright. Right. Yeah. Right. 600 times 12 minus 20. I got you. Okay. We're going to move on to the next topic now. The hard and fast flipper. about fixing and flipping houses, you know, it's a, it's a tough job. You've got to find a steel, you've got to be good at renovating it, and uh, you've, got to, uh, you've got to be able to go through it with a sense of urgency, have a savvy and a way of getting contractors and getting everything done the time to manage it all, and those are the intangibles that will determine your success, besides your credit income and assets, is your time, your savvy, your experience, and your sense of urgency. Um, now we'll talk about that a little bit more 
But those are a lot of personal intangibles that a lot of you will have to weigh in um, for yourselves. So, if you make fifty thousand dollars in profit on a flip, you can make a million dollars in twenty flips. How long would it take most of you to do twenty flips? <laughs> I mean, forty you years. Just kill me now. <laughs> three years. <laughs> huh? Two or three a year. Two or three a year. For uh, someone starting out. Four years. Four or five years. Take three months off for the second year. All right. So let me give you let me give you the basic underwriting guidelines on something like this. Now we now you can qualify for a line of credit uh, millions of dollars when you start doing fifty houses a year, and you have a million dollar net worth. Until then, it's pretty much based on each deal individually. And there are people that have large crews, and they do multiple houses, and they renovate them. A lot of times they redirect into new construction, which is a slightly different topic. Um, but let's go over these criteria. So you do multiple flips. We'll finance 90% loan to value and let you roll, let you roll your, your closing costs if, you, if you're doing this on a regular basis. This is acquisition and rehab. So it's hard money, it has the highest interest rate, but it's by far the best product for something like this because it has the highest cash on cash return and it finances the most. And I'll qualify those comments in just a minute. <clears throat> if you have a house that has an after repair value of $300,000 and you're able to buy it for a hundred, and put $100,000 into it, you need $200,000 plus closing costs. Hard money, if you're experienced and do multiple deals, in most cases, avoiding the niche products, such as the one that offer you 100% financing, which are usually not um, obtainable. We'll require you to come to closing with $20,000. Okay? So, in this scenario, you could bring $20,000 cash to closing, fix a property up, cash out or refinance it, and be in and done for $20,000 plus your payments, which is your holding costs. Let's say this is at 12%, um, so that'd be $1,800 a month. And uh, uh, we'll, we'll pick that apart later, but this loan limit is limited to 75% loan to value of the ARV. That's the 180 that you're borrowing. No, that's the $300,000 is the after repair value. No, I understand, but yes. you're going to need 180 loan on this. Right. Okay. Right. So if you find a scenario like this, um, and then you go to sell it, right? Let's say you're in and out in six months, okay? 180 times six, holding costs, right? Uh, your closing costs, we're gonna charge a couple points, the hedge fund's gonna charge a couple points, the attorney and everyone else is gonna be a couple points, the junk fees. So you're gonna have, let's just say, $15,000 Say twenty thousand in close in in uh, no, it's more like 
four, six, eight, about fifteen thousand dollars with homeowners insurance and builders risk and all that, and closing costs. Okay. When you go to sell it, you're gonna have real estate commission. So let's say you sell it for three hundred thousand. Six percent of three hundred thousand is eighteen thousand. As great as it is, you only made 50 grand on it after it's all done. They still got capital gains, right? No, no, no. It's a board Yeah, you can keep rolling. Yeah. Yeah, if you pay that tax, it's a whole tax on that, so you probably. Mm -hmm. you, you could, uh, yeah. Yeah, you, you, so, yeah. yeah, you could avoid it. So, what's the tax? What's the tax bracket on that, Kirk? Well, whatever your your marginal tax rate is. So, if your ordinary income is your fifteen percent or whatever the, mm -hmm. your, your tax rate is. Okay. So this isn't a tax course, but that's good information to know. So, on, on this fantastic of a deal, by the time it's all said and done, you may make fifty thousand dollars. So flips are hard. Now, if, it, if you go into a hold scenario where you can sell for more, um, you can make more money on a flip. For example, the quadruplex is an example too, where it obtained through hard money. And um, he later refinanced out of it and got his cash back. So it is the best way to get a property with the least amount of down payment. Because to do this any other way, you're only going to get 70% financing on 100, and you're going to pay for all the renovations out of your pocket. So it's the difference between coming to closing with 20 grand or $130,000. And that's why it serves the best purpose for distressed properties. Hard, hard money. Hard money, yeah. Let's go over this scenario. This is a deal that we recently closed on. Number three. We got Keith Roseberry Jr. in here, so his, his dad did this appraisal. I meant to black some of this stuff out, but I didn't get to all of it. We'll have to uh, circulate an NDA agreement. Number three, this property was, was bought for 390000 Tree had fallen on it. It was being sold as is. And they fixed, you know, the, the seller didn't want to fix the tree. It's on Powers Ferry Road near Chastain Park. Um, after repair value, it's estimated to be at 775. As is value, it's estimated at 450, and they they bought it for 390. This is by the appraiser, and the appraisal's in here. This is the closing statement. So after you do a couple deals with us, we, we, don't, we don't charge two points anymore. We start to charge one, and we keep you there for life. So we keep you for life. Our hedge fund doesn't necessarily play by the same rules, though. <coughs> so if he actually takes this house 
remodels the kitchens and baths, sells it in six months for seven seventy five. What should he realistically expect to be making as a cash on cash return? Great question. Let's walk through it. He hasn't done enough deals to be at 10% down with financing the closing costs, so he had to cover his own closing costs. Um, so the 10% plus closing costs made his cash to close 58429 If you look on the bottom page of the HUD, we don't have a CD, we have a HUD, it was an investment property. for the closing cost on this transaction? Put it out at once. Uh, open for the deal. 90 Okay. You can round that up to 20. So we got a 390 acquisition. We got a $75,000 rehab budget. We've got $20,000 Closing costs. Where is it? amount of money needed is with these numbers 485,000 if his cash to close was 58,000 essentially half his closing costs were allowed to be financed Four eighty five minus fifty eight. All right. Now I'm going to deviate from the HUD just for simplicity purposes. Okay. So one percent a month. Four thousand. $270. Multiply that. Well, actually, his first payment's not due until um, there's an interim interest of a couple months in here, which is really an impound. But I'm not going to get that detailed. I'm going to say there's four months of debt service on this. So his debt service cost is going to be 17.
he does happen to sell this thing for the expected seven seventy five. He's going to have 46000 in real estate commission. Taxes. I'm just going to put $3,000 for his proration of taxes. So his goal, his movement, his action, what he's trying to do, sell this thing and bring home $281,000. <coughs> That's his objective. He plans on listing it, holding it, finishing it in six months, paying his fair portion of taxes and real estate commissions. Once you subtract out the after repair value from his money into it, We've got $348,000 once we subtract out holding costs, real estate commissions, tax proration. We've got $281,420. He did spend $58,000. And if he arrives at $281,000 after spending 58 plus 17, he will have more than quadrupled his money. And his cash on cash return, the way I calculate it, would be 58 plus the 17, divide that by the 281. And this is an ideal scenario, very risky, but the way that the bigger, more lucrative fix and flippers make money in an, in an aggressive type A man. Now, another method of doing this is the guys that take their IRAs and buy $40,000 houses on the courthouse steps and let those appreciate and they rent them slowly. Um, you know, uh, using money out of pocket, which has a lot less risk and is a much slower plan. I wanted to give you an example of a best case scenario. Because I do a lot of time talking to talk people out of fixing flips. But this is one that I approve. Because even if he comes in $100,000 less, it's still a good day at the park. And that's what this is. This is going into a poker game with $70,000 and trying to leave with $280,000. I mean, in this particular investor I work with on a number of projects, and he's got about four that he's going. But he's got a skill finding $750,000 houses for three three ninety. Yeah. That's a skill. Mm -hmm. That's where it starts. Well, this one was under our noses. It was right on Power Square. It was there for a while. It's, good. it's all about marketing, too. But his objective is to do four of these a year and to make a million dollars a year doing it. And he's one of the top 10 percentile. He's, he's good at it. He's doing well. 
He's got me on his team. That doesn't hurt. But 90% um, of the flippers don't come close to this. The failure rate for the first time flippers about as good a chance of opening a restaurant to me. Is that 95%? No. It's, it's about 50-50. It depends on, on the person and their savvy. Um, uh, you know, but if we won't do your loan, you should run from that project. I'll tell you that. Or if you're required to put a lot down, because that means you're not meeting the 75% of the ARV criteria. And there's a lot more crappy deals now than ever. Especially, you know, being peddled uh, confidently on the, the web. <coughs> the measure, measuring, what we, what we measure this by, how good of a deal this is, is the cash on cash return. So in this scenario, 58 plus 17, 65, 75. 75. Yeah, this is 75%. So this would be the equivalent of putting $100,000 in the stock market and pulling out $375,000 six months later. <clears throat> real, estate, real estate's the only engine where this can be obtained. Now, this is gambling. But it's an educated, smart gamble. I'd be curious what your, uh, uh, if you kept stats on the loans that go across your desk, what the ROI average, and then first time flippers ROI average, multi, which of those would be interesting stats? Mm -hmm. It would be. What I love about hard money and that the private investing lending industry is giving guys a chance to make big ticket money is that this non reporting. Ten years ago, you try this and fail, your credit's going to get beaten and you're not going to play again for another decade. Now you get mulligans, because these guys don't report. So if you try this and fail, and it does with hard money, it doesn't blemish your credit history. If you do, I mean, if you do ten of them, and one of them turns out badly, and on ten of them you make a hundred thousand, and one of them you, you decide to allow the hedge fund real estate group to reclaim title because you're right over your head and you just can't make it work. It doesn't stop your production and your workflow and your ability to continue to work. Ten years ago, you'd have a foreclosure on your records. Hmm. Well, not that we'd ever recommend you, um, giving the house back to the lender. Uh, you know, in this business, I'd leave it being ethical and you just <coughs> eat that loss. you just out of pocket. In that example, yeah, it was a bad example. Um, but some people have no choice. And um, let's say you have a beginning investor that went broke, fell on his face, can't finish. At least he's not um, blacklisted for a decade. So two years later, when you check the guy out, you can't, there's no fingerprints of that failed loan? Mm -hmm. They're not reported. That's very interesting. Mm -hmm. Most of your commercial loans done in LLC's names are not reported. Now, they may still come up. So it's they're gonna, a personal note? It's, it's not recourse? I don't it's understand. recourse. So recourse means that if you um, breach your contract, you can personally get sued. Most people, most investors don't go after people like that. It's recourse, but that's just pretty much to avoid you from squatting there. You know, in case you things go adversarial. 
Plus, LLCs can be formed and switched. If it's, if it's not in recourse, you might as well just, you know, make a loan based on hope. You know, you've got to have a person assigned to it. The entity can be won by anyone at any point. <clears throat> any questions on that scenario so far? It's on the, uh, it's on the, it's on the HUD, but I kind of rounded it. With the 23? 23, but you got some seller paid items. So it's funds to be paid by seller. Is that? You got me yeah. What line is it? What line is it? Um, it's cost of closing, and it's the finance of the commercial pay closing statement. Pages are not really enough. Biggest thing to avoid with doing a fix and flip is don't run out of money. There's a number one reason for failure. It's going to be people running out of money. Oftentimes, by underestimating the rehab budget. Other times, by going going into a project using everything. Passive reserves. How common is it for people? We had a on income before and after. Uh, we had a several months ago. We had a property in Druid Hills where a part of the Flipper's team was somebody who simply brought, you know, the 25% to the table, because they had nothing. Mm -hmm. some, you know, that was, and, and some expertise. I mean, it's common. So if the range is 10 to 20% down, right? People will say as low as 10% down, and they, they mean as low as 10% down, the range is 10 to 20 percent. So if you've never done a deal, this is your first go at it, they're going to ask you for 20 percent and then and to pay your own closing costs. So that's probably how they wrote, arrived at 20, 25 percent or whatever. And if you've done a couple deals, you might have 15 percent down. So this, this is his third or fourth deal this year. He's at 10 percent down plus half his closing costs. His next deal will probably be 10% down financing his closing costs. Does he need it? <clears throat> Not really. <clears throat> but is he seriously hedging his risk by borrowing money? Definitely. Would you spend $17,000 to protect half a million? I would. Even if you're at 6% interest only, which is unheard of, that, that number would be 8,500. So really, you're talking about a best case scenario, actual cost of 8,500 to protect half a million dollars? I'm such an advocate of hard money, it's ridiculous. <clears throat> um, interest rates range from 9 to 12%. Pick your battles. 12% is not a big deal in this case. Um, it's, uh, you could beat it down to nine and a half after you do several deals, but that's not a gigantic savings. And the time you spend per flip is gonna be really what determines your success as well as your interest. Time management is a very important topic. A lot of us are working. Um, knowing what to do with your time is essential <coughs> to success in a lot of things, but especially flipping property. Calculate the cash on cash return. That's the measurement of the success of the flip. At the general meeting, we went into an example of a flip that didn't work out, that that became a short-term hold, um, and then it worked out later by making it a short-term hold 
And that's also common. Your opportunity cost, a lot of us have great jobs and we make six-figure incomes. Your opportunity cost is, what is the cost of not going to work costing you? You bill out $100 an hour. You're going to take all day to do a rehab? You're losing $1,000. So even if you make $50,000 on a rehab and it requires you to take off six months from your job, is it worth it? But if you make a million dollars a year doing a rehab, it requires you to take all day off your job, then it's worth it. Be aware of your opportunity cost. Be aware of your time. Be honest with yourself about your savvy and your sense of urgency about finishing a project before you go into something like that. And cash on cash return is going to be the measure of your accomplishment. <clears throat> I'm going to go into a buy and hold in Athens. Let's hand out number four. Looks like this. Flip through to the end, to the beginning of the next section. So we did these through uh, Finance of America. Kurt liked that company. Pick this example, make him happy. Like make the Kurt happy. <clears throat> we did this one, stated income Kurt, at 6.1 with F of A. <clears throat> this investor was able to get seven houses for four, on foreclosure. Um, student houses near, near uh, EGA and Athens. We did them all at 6.1% or 20% down. <clears throat> Finance America is Blackstone. Blackstone, the hedge fund, opened up Finance America and we broke some to them. <clears throat> so, if you're financing a project, it's all about the positive cash flow and the debt service coverage ratio. If this project is more like something that um, you looked, you seek to obtain, you'd measure the quality of this project by measuring the debt service coverage ratio. Unless you're doing it all in cash, then you'd be doing it, measuring it with cap rate. But for most of us, we'd be measuring it with DSCR. What's the profitability? How much is the net income? What's the debt service coverage ratio? So this came out to a solid million. And the purchase price was 1.275. We broke them up into individual notes because we could have done this as a blanket. But if someone needs to sell a property because they need money and it's in a blanket, <coughs> the whoever's holding the note is going to give you some pushback. And oftentimes it's going to make you pay off a disproportionate amount of the loan to get the blanket lien released. So I'm anti-blanket loans. I like doing individual property loans on individual properties. It doesn't really cost any more or less, but it gives you the flexibility to sell stuff off when an uh, uh, opportunity, opportunity or necessity presents itself. If someone wants to buy one of these properties and they want to pay a premium for it, this investor has the flexibility to sell one. 
And that's why we did individual loans. What if someone wants to pay 50000 more than what she bought it for this year? She has the opportunity to sell it and recoup $100,000. If it was a blanket loan, the lender could easily say, uh, no, we want 99% of the proceeds to release this one property because you could have been deferring maintenance from the other properties and keeping this one in the free. And who's to say the logic's not right? But that's why um, blanket loans can be adverse. Let's see here. On this particular deal, I remember that we lent a million. Commercial world. Um, if I'm making, if, is it relevant to what I make if I buy a property that's positively cash flowing? Well, it depends on what the lender cares about. Right. Fannie cares and, and soft money doesn't. Portfolio doesn't. So this, in this realm, your personal income is irrelevant. It's completely based on the debt service covered ratio and soft money. So at 6.125. Yeah, it's insanely good for a non-TTI loan. One million. How much is the payment? Someone with a financial calculator, some of the payment is on six point on one million dollars, thirty year AM at six point one two five. Say again? Six oh seven six. Six oh seven six? I heard you right. Yeah. All right. On the back of the cover page is how much each property rents for. And why the range? Is that PI? PI or PI? I'm sorry. PI. Um, let's add uh, uh, 200 per property for PITI. So let's add 1400. Okay. Those are taxes. We can make it an even 2,000. Okay. So we've got 1,300 plus 1,400 plus 1,400 plus 1,400 plus 1,700 plus 1,700 plus 1,800 is the rental rates. Ten seven. Now, the LTVs before this year were at seventy percent. This is the first year anyone's ever gotten this aggressive with the loan to values on state income investment properties. Eighty percent. Yeah, wow. So yeah, these are all at eighty percent. Um, so that's going to skew your numbers on the DSCR because they're going to be lower than they normally would because the down payment was so high. In this case, they're at 1.32 to 1. Was there anything special about this borrower that got such good terms? 800 credit score. It. And so what would it, the terms drop to for seven? Um, so par actually, she's she. This investor spent a lot on discount too. So, so she bought down. She she bought it down five or six times. Actually. So there's there was close to five or six points in discount on on at that rate. The par. On this product was seven and a quarter at eighty percent. 
at 70%, I think par was 6.875. Discounts I'm not really a big fan of, but this investor had a specific exit strategy for three to five years. And the passive income is decent at a couple grand a month, but really the investor was into it for the appreciation, expecting to see 20% um, in three to five years, and then to unload the 1.3 million for more like 1.7, pull out $400,000 in profit, and have a small passive income, which is really the technique and strategy in the slow and soft short-term holds. Haven't you done any improvements to the packages? Not really. They're already rents. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's once again, you're just taking gross rent to calculate the debt service. Cost. Right. Because this guy's got no cash flow for that again. Because at acquisition, they're in good shape. It's a short-term strategy. And truly, the end goal is the equity appreciation. Yeah. Had this been yeah, a long... Just look at condo dues and vacancies. And that. It doesn't say what the dues are. There's no, I don't think there are any on this one. I thought passive income class, the one before this last one, they sent out an email. There were four bedroom condos in Clemson in the 70s, four of them for sale. I don't think anyone bought them, but I sure would have. <laughs> where were they in Clemson? Um, I don't know where the, where the bridge is, where you go up the main street on the university place. Yeah, I know exactly where that is. Anyway, these I mean, are, I these are 200. <laughs> The other thing is, you got you know, you got a wicked range of rents from 1500 to 1800 So mm -hmm. I think they're thinking rents are going to go to market. They are. They are. That's going to raise the cash flow. Yep, and they're all pretty pretty similar. So they are expecting rents to go up. But truly, the end game in this is going to be the equity appreciation. That's the hedge. Not to mention, they're undervalued. This was bought by a bank at a bank foreclosure. So if you look at the Sonova short sale payoff, um, they're probably worth 10% uh, more now. Yeah, but those damn students, you know, they cheer your fleece. Uh, let's turn it down. Yeah. <laughs> As a Rick, uh, the bottom line on this example to me is um, everyone here who does not have uh, uh, a day job that would need to use a lender that doesn't look at DTI, raise your hand if you don't have a day job and would need this type of loan. So this is this is great news that you can get um, seven and a quarter interest rate, eighty percent uh, loan to value, and, and modest uh, closing costs. Yeah. So on soft money, um, there's no secondary market. Lender can't pay our fee through yield spread premium. It doesn't exist. Uh, so we charge the two points um, plus our standard processing fee. But the lender is not a hedge fund. So they usually have a one time underwriting fee, usually fixed around 1500 The range is 1300 to, to, to 1500 So you got some closing costs. But to me, when you don't have a day job, um, being able to buy. Uh, to get a 30-year loan on a rental property without a day job, uh, and this low expense, I got two of these, but my costs were 7.5 percent, and it was 70 percent LTV through angel loan. So, competition, since I got those two loans, uh, has really beaten down the, the terms to be really favorable. So, how do you make an assessment that? The banks saying these are in good shape just because you're buying them. I mean, this isn't, I think, typically run down. There was inspections. There was inspections. Yeah. They actually went there. Yeah. I believe the settlement, one of the settlement statements shows that there's a renovation uh, allowance of $20,000. Yeah. I was well, buying them for less expenses. Yeah. It's, 
So there's a page that shows there's a twenty thousand dollar improvement renovation paid by the seller, which is the Bank of Tenovis, for bringing them up to standards. Now, if the rents are undervalued and the rent should be eighteen hundred per unit, such as one of the units is, that times seven is twelve thousand six hundred. Twelve thousand six hundred. Divide that by the eight thousand and seventy-six. Brings our debt service coverage ratio up, does it not? Yeah, almost one point five. One point five six. So, a raising rent strategy would be complementary to increasing the values and the investor's exit strategy. If we're using the one percent factor, and we have you know one point three million, let's say one point four million is the fair market value, then we would have fourteen thousand dollars in rental income. If we're dividing that by the same eight zero seven six, then especially over time, fourteen thousand divide that by eight zero seven six is 1.73 to 1. So there's more than one way to look at every deal. The truth will be uncovered when you sell it or with the cash flow. <laughs> the truth will be uncovered when you sell it. Well, as an investor, it, your investor in this case was expecting that they would be able to sell it for X cap rate in three or four years and make their appreciation? Yeah. What, what were they, ex how did they arrive at with that expected cap rate? Is there expected that the market will generally pay 10 or only? 1% gross rent multiplier based on an appreciation to 1.7 million in three years. So this was a foreclosure. It's worth at least 1.4 million now. It's slightly undervalued, right? So what's 1.4 million at 6% appreciation worth in three to five years? We've done this exercise. 14000 present value. Let's say we're in a gross spurt at 5.5%. 5.5 is our yield. Uh, let's say 60 months, five years. Zero payment compute future value. We're at 1.84 million in five years at 5.5 constant growth yield. So this investor's strategy is to make half a million dollars in equity appreciation, small piece here and there as the income grows, enough to live off of, but really to cash out on the exit sale, which is the concept of the short-term hold. So cash on cash, they're at about 200, about 200 percent. Uh, not if you analyze it. Not if you annualize it, because that's a five-year period. The cash on cash is always expressed in terms of an annualized. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But anything is usually yeah. But it's a nice deal, regardless. It's a great deal. I don't Fantastic like expensive deal. houses like that, but uh, the cap game is looking good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and Athens is a good mark. Yeah, we passed it. You lent on it. I, I green-lighted it. Yeah. So we haven't got much in the seller carryback seconds, but we will soon. Karen, you want to say something? Um, no personal income required based on debt, debt service coverage right. ratio. It's 12.30. Uh, people bring their own lunch. What's happening for lunch? Lunch is in 10 minutes. Uh -oh. 10, 10 or 20. They're, they're being here between 12.30 and 1. So. Yeah. We've, we've kept your hunger in, on top of our minds. And we, will, we will not allow you to suffer. <laughs> Karen will throw something at me as soon as the food gets here. I no, guarantee it. Um, 
Strategy three and four is investment property. Um, next is going to be commercial, so I want to get through this section. Um, loan amounts are up to 80% loan to value. Now, if I say 10% down is required, that means you can carry back 10% under finance, but 10% of your own money is required. Um, mathematically, obviously, most people have 20% down in that case. Um, no personal income required. Avoid niche products. I can't say it enough. Niche products, more times than not, end up, to end up badly. I've tried it. If someone treats me badly, they're not going to see business from me again, so they're more likely to treat me well than you, I can tell you that. Because we cut lenders off all the time for not doing a good job. Um, I don't know what that means, Rick. So what does niche product mean? A niche product is when someone says they have a specialty product that no one else has. How is that possible that they have a specialty product? They have one investor that crawled out of something that says we're going to do 100% financing on fix and flips? Okay. Is that because your investor is a, uh, um, has a real estate portfolio? I mean, that would make sense. Because you're gonna, your default rate is going to be no, oh, oh, triple. Is another way for it to get houses? I can. <laughs> yeah. Or it's just a BS product, and those investors are gone as quickly as they appear. So, when you have an, if you, let's say, most most common niche product is 100% financing on fixed flips. I hear them all the time, and I ignore them as soon as I hear them, because um, a lot of times those products are gone. As soon as they arrive, and if you have one in the pipe and you're trying to close on it, and the investor pulls out, then you, you got nowhere else to go. If it's not a standard product, I usually don't do it. I mean, I, I've seen a, a dozen different types of niche products come and go over the years, and they've all ended with a pipeline of crap and the investor pulled out. Yeah, but you're a broker, I'm, I'm a borrower, so whatever it's term sheet that some new broker sends me will not have at the top niche product. So, right. So I, I don't yeah. know a niche product from anything. Well, your spidey sense will tingle the hairs in the back of your neck a little bit. That's probably the yeah. best thing. Well, give me another example. Non-recourse self-directed IRA loans. Okay. I'll call, I'll get by flyers, I'll call the rep. I'm like, does this product really exist? He's like, please don't send it to me. We've never closed one. That's all I need to know. Because I have people constantly asking me for non-recourse self-directed IRA loans. And, uh, well, I know two lenders who are selling in the market for a long, long time. Yeah, Finance of America uh, advertises first, one of those. First, first national Yeah. FNB. And, and, and they exist. And, the closing, and, and I'm not going to say no one's ever closed one. But the closing percentage is low. And the terms aren't very aggressive. And they're, um, they're usually in and out. There are probably some niche products that, that work just fine. But as a rule, I tend to avoid them. Uh, well, I close to 50% um, LTV, 8% uh, 20-year amortizing, 10-year balloon. Non-recourse? Yeah, yeah, so I, in my self-directed IRA. Yeah. And um, the self-directed IRA was a borrower? Yeah. And, and uh, who was the lender? First National Bank, FNB, uh, something or other. Um, they're, they've been in the market 10 years. Okay. So um, they've been around, they will be around, but they're picky. Yeah. Min loan amount is 100, uh, and you've got a season of the property for at least 12 months okay. before they'll lend up. That's cool. That's a good product. Um, I, I, I've been discouraged against sending in those types of loans, you know, our conversion rate from to closing is in the 90 percentile. So if every other deal works out, that's not a manageable relationship for us. Yeah, well, 50 percent LTV and 8 percent is not that aggressive. So yeah. It would, but it was good money for us uh, yeah. four years ago. Yeah, it's good to know that exists. We tripled our money. Mm -hmm. um, pitfalls. Management landlord skills required. Save yourself cash closing by having the seller pay closing costs when possible. 
don't over renovate rentals. Big thing to watch out for. And, and bad tenants and squatters are, of course, another nightmare. So, here's a case study of an investment strategy. Joe finds a house for sale for 200000 Rehab budget is 100. After repair value is expected at 400,000. Joe puts 30,000 dollars of his own money in. Seller pays closing costs. Joe is new, and his interest-only loan is at 12 percent per year with a one-year call. Joe finances 270,000 with a monthly interest-only payment of 2,700. After six months on the market, house doesn't sell. Joe gets a tenant. Joe wants uh, to. Uh, Tenant wants to buy the house, wants her credits in good enough condition to qualify. This happens all the time, by the way. Joe sells an option for $5,000 to buy a $400,000 at plus 3% inflation, and rents the house for $3,000 per month. Um, Joe refinances the $280,000 with uh, ECI at 6.5% for 7 7.1 arm, 30 year AM, monthly payment of $1,760. Nine two thousand dollars PITI house rents three thousand over two thousand. That's a one point five to one debt service coverage ratio. Cash flow is a thousand dollars per month, and then he gets one hundred and twenty thousand dollars at the sale. Joe does two per year. How long until Joe makes a million? What if Joe likes passive income? And the um, and the equity appreciation, should he maintain the property, for example, as a consideration. How many of these sort of properties would Joe need to, to do to make $20,000 per month passively? Okay. He's making $1,000 a month. That's right. Keep it simple. So, When you look at a property, and you say, is this a fix and flip, or is this a buy and hold? Fix and flip, it's, does it have the potential to make a cash on cash return? But if it doesn't work out as a fix and flip, and it is a good buy and hold, you have an easy out. You can rent it. Sell it later, maybe. A lot of times the renters want lease purchase contracts. And that will be your saving grace if you call the fix and flip wrong. So, in this scenario, Joe calls his fix and flip wrong, can't sell it. But he can sell it later to, a right, to the right renter. And turns it into a win by cash flowing it. Which happens very often. Which is why you may want to make sure your fix and flips with debt service coverage in the event the flip doesn't pan out and you have to um, rent it and sell it later. It's called the accidental landlord. <laughs> so what are the terms on the, when would he exit this property? I'm sorry? When would he exit this property? Exactly. Exactly. So, um, when the tenant buyer gets a, a, a new loan, yeah, yeah, but you probably put a qualifier in it. Should, it should say the options for X number of years. Yeah. yeah. There's, that's common for a, for an option. So the purchase price. Four hundred thousand dollars plus three percent appreciate inflation or appreciation. That would be four twelve after the first year. Four twenty four after the second year. Four thirty seven after the third year.
subtract out the 270 that he owes. He'll make 167000 plus a $1,000 a month in rental income, plus a $5,000 option fee. That's turning what could have been a, a, a bad loss into a win by taking a fix and flip <coughs> and making it a short-term hold. And that's the... Analyzing these numbers is theoretically what you should know how to do. But the mentality is that the, the subject property that you're entertaining has a cash on cash return if it's a flip and a positive cash flow debt service coverage ratio if it's a, um, if it's a hold because cash is king and you want to maintain and grow that liquid asset. A lot of investors are taking properties subject to it with no equity to make some money on this relationship with no real skin in the game. So interesting to look at it from the buyer's standpoint. She buys in three years for 437. 5% loan, 5% down, and mm -hmm. what would be the payment on it? Well, a 5% loan with 5% down would be 22 29 a month, principal okay. and interest, less than just paying rent. Of course, she's got the taxes and mm -hmm. if she can get 5% down. Right. Yeah. And, you know, uh, from a credit standpoint, there's a number of things that we can do to improve people's credit. And, and we get a lot of investors that have options that want to sell their house. Uh, we do things the, the expensive way. We throw money at creditors, pay bills down, pay off things that are recent. Don't make the mistake of paying off old collections. It usually drops your scores. Uh, but simulators, um, if anyone needs a credit report, we can pull a mortgage credit report for you. And you can run a credit simulator, and you can see exactly what needs to be done to improve your credit if anyone needs that. Also, if anyone has their tax returns with all the schedules um, or wants to send them to me, we can analyze your income and show you um, what to do or what not to do in those in different categories to improve your ability to borrow on full documentation type loans. What's the sweet spot for this? I've heard, maybe you actually answered this already, is three years sort of the sweet spot for other financing on a property? Um, three to five, you know, the longer it is, the more appreciation there usually is. Um, but I would say three to five to not lose interest. I wouldn't go above five. Once you start talking about more than five years, it's, it comes beyond, beyond the scope of reality for a lot of people. You know, short term options, two to three years. Increasing the price with Inflation is usually something that everyone can agree exists. Everyone agrees there's inflation. And everyone will normally say the property is worth this now. We're going to increase it by this percentage per year. Um, that normally should be something that most reasonable people would agree to. So this scenario is, is, uh, is manageable. Um, then, of course, it's got to appraise. So, you don't want to run into a, a, a hurdle there. Is this a CYA? Would anybody actually want to go into this plan B? Is this, or is this pretty much just a CYA for a failed flip? Both. A lot of people buy fix and flips and then cash out refinance them, as was example two, into short-term or long-term holds. Example two is a long-term hold. Um, uh, example four is a short-term hold. Uh, so you normally make more money on taking a, a, a rehabbed property and into a short-term hold. 
than you do just selling it out right hard money. Even after closing costs and all that. Yeah, because you usually don't have as much closing costs converting it from hard to soft. It's a good chance he's changed it to cap gains. Yeah. It's on his history. But the but the four hundred thousand dollar property that appraises for seven seventy five the after a pair of our seven percent five wouldn't pass wouldn't pass the DSCR. That's a flip and that's all it is. I, I, I guess I'm struggling with the idea of um, you know, the reality and rental rates and you know, like for example that house in Louisville. We lived in Louisville street mm -hmm. there's no way that house would rent for three thousand dollars right you know so you know like we sold a similar house that's why i know that mm -hmm. <laughs> and closer in um in a more desirable area school right. district all of that and that was one of our challenges because we thought about you know so that we could go ahead and move mm -hmm. renting that house but there was no way even with the very low mortgage that we had that we would be able to make that Makes sense. Right. So the under a hundred houses have a pretty safe one percent gross rent multiplier. If you have a house that's a hundred thousand dollars, it probably rents for a thousand bucks a month. As you increase in value, the multiplier goes down. And then it's based on the area and based on the methods. So um, this is not that's specific research that you have to do for specific areas that you want to target and work in. Um, it's not a blanket rule that you can uniformly apply. Well, and then also the concern is like, people agree to these rents, but like a lot of reasons why people can't buy it because, you know, maybe they're having challenges in managing mm -hmm. their funds. So it's like they agree to these terms, but then, then you're c carrying the property and dealing with having to get someone out of a property they end up not being able to pay their rent. Yeah. You know, so that's just... So, so, Kurt, how many properties do you own? Uh, 38. And uh, how many of those properties rent for more than 1%? Um, all of them. But I've been very... Um, Selective? Developed a strategy where I just bought high performing houses by moving to an area that has high performing houses. I didn't just stay in Atlanta and say, uh, I'm suffering because they don't exist. I went to where they were. So my houses are all over and they perform well. Church's not in this price range either. So. Right. right. Yeah, you know, the 1% the rule really kind, of, kind of bugs me because really what that boils down to is an 8 cap. That's all it's doing. Mm -hmm. You can take one third, right? You're getting 12% rent. You can take one third for operating expenses. You're looking at it's an 8 cap property. It just guarantees you're an 8 cap property. And it's not a rule. That's not hard to do. My, my student rental is really good. Twice that. By the way, guys, I was kidding. When I said students are bad, for those of you who don't know me, I own 50 or so of student rental properties. Um, but when you get up in the, my, my Alpharetta condos, don't do the 1%. And what's their price point? And now they're about 180 and the top rent in there is about 1400 so it's not quite. Are they over 0 0.75? 0 0.75 what? Of 1%. Are they more than, they're not 1%. They're 1400 instead of 1800 Okay. So they're right at 0 0.75. They're about 0.8. So we're going to break. Um, when you guys get back, <coughs> we'll talk about leveraging and uh, commercial commercial strategies. And what are we going to do tomorrow? Tomorrow, we're going to talk about specific scenarios and assets management and uh, more on leveraging. <coughs>